This lesson will go through the areas of knowledge, which is how the IB breaks up and categorises all human knowledge. In lesson one, we will go through two areas of knowledge, mathematics and the natural sciences. In your talk presentation and talk essay, you'll be asked to narrow down your topic and focus on one or two areas of knowledge, depending on your presentation question or your essay title. To help us get our heads around each one, the IB Talk Guide gives us a suggested knowledge framework that helps us to brainstorm the important issues related to each area of knowledge. This is what the knowledge framework looks like. As you can see, there are five ways to approach each area of knowledge. First, we can look at scope and applications. This aspect covers the range of knowledge in the area and how that knowledge is used. Next, we can unpack relevant concepts and language. This element explores the key ideas in each area and how we produce and describe knowledge using technical, area-specific language. Then we have methodology, which refers to the distinct methods that each area uses to produce knowledge. We'll also investigate the historical development of each area of knowledge, focusing on changes over time. Finally, don't forget the links to personal knowledge. Individuals can personally contribute to shared knowledge within an area of knowledge, just as shared knowledge can impact individuals personally. Now, let's explore the key ideas in each area of knowledge using this helpful knowledge framework. Along the way, we'll explore links between specific areas of knowledge. We'll also analyse the similarities and differences between specific areas. First up, mathematics. What are the scope and applications of mathematics? That is, what is maths actually about? It's hard to pin down a definition. This is how the IB defines the scope of mathematics. It deals with numbers and quantities, with shapes and spaces, and with rates and changes. Even though we can define mathematics in other ways, let's stick with this definition for now. Now let's think about the applications of mathematics. Mathematics is fundamental to how we understand and produce knowledge in many different areas. For example, a natural scientist might use mathematics to process quantitative data and plot that data onto a graph. An economist might use mathematics to analyse changes in the price of a certain stock. In the arts, you might use maths to determine the proportions of a painting. Because mathematics can apply to most areas of knowledge, we can describe maths as being universally applicable and often timeless. This means that fundamental mathematical truths span across different cultures and time periods. Think about how maths could apply to other areas like religious knowledge systems or ethics. You might be surprised by how broad the applications of mathematics really are. Next, let's dive into the concepts and language in mathematics. Mathematical concepts are extremely diverse due to the broad scope of this area of knowledge. Even so, many concepts rely on fundamental elements, such as axioms, theorems and proofs. We'll discuss these key elements in the next section on methodology. Mathematical language typically refers to the symbols and notation that are used to communicate knowledge in maths. For example, pronumerals like X and Y form the language of algebra. These sets of symbols often represent abstract concepts such as sets and relations. Now, let's discuss the methodology of maths. Many mathematical concepts are developed through deductive reasoning. To begin, we'll outline the process of deductive reasoning. You start with a premise or statement that you accept as true. Then, you use reason to draw conclusions from this initial premise. If the initial premise is true, 
then the conclusion is valid. For example, if it is true that 2 times x equals 8 and 8 divided by 2 equals 4, then mathematicians can use deductive reasoning to deduce that x must equal 4. In mathematics, axioms often provide a starting premise for deductive reasoning. Axioms are statements and rules that everyone accepts as true. This means that mathematicians don't need to prove an axiom every time they use one. They can simply use the axiom as part of their reasoning process. But remember, a statement isn't actually true unless it has been proved. For example, the Greek mathematician Euclid came up with an axiom. All right angles are equal to each other. In general, mathematicians will accept this statement as true. Theorems are what mathematicians call truths that we prove via deductive processes. Don't forget, statements are only true once they've been proved. Mathematicians will begin with one or more axioms, use deductive reasoning, and derive knowledge in the form of theorems. Maybe you've studied some theorems in maths class, like Pythagoras' theorem. This states that for a right-angled triangle, the length of the hypotenuse squared equals to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. As you've probably noticed, the formal methodology of maths emphasises pure reason above other, more subjective ways of knowing, like sense perception or faith. But is reason really the only way of knowing encountered in maths? Some say that intuition is crucial for developing new mathematical knowledge. For example, Pythagoras's intuition might have hinted at a relationship between the three sides of a right-angled triangle. This might have motivated him to use reason to further explore the relationship and deduce the famous Pythagoras' theorem. Others claim that imagination is needed to spark new mathematical ideas. What do you think? Is maths really just based on reason? All right, let's explore the historical development of mathematics. Mathematical developments often shift how we view the world. For example, negative numbers didn't appear in India until the 7th century AD. This provided moneylenders with a new way to record debts. And what about the early work of Greek mathematicians, like Pythagoras, who helped develop the seven-note musical scale? What would music sound like today without this musical scale? Consider how this might have affected another area of knowledge, the arts. In terms of links to personal knowledge, Throughout history, many mathematicians have contributed personal knowledge to the shared knowledge that makes up mathematics as a whole. This reliance on personal knowledge to create shared knowledge has worried some mathematicians. Could the reason-based methodology of maths be compromised by personal biases? One famous mathematician and philosopher, René Descartes, reported discoveries after an angel appeared to him in a dream. The angel told him, the conquest of nature is to be achieved through number and measure. Did Descartes' reliance on faith and his imagination potentially affect the quality of his mathematical contributions? This is one question you might consider when trying to evaluate the impact of personal knowledge on shared knowledge in mathematics. You might also consider another question. Do individuals invent mathematical knowledge or do they discover it? As well as letting personal knowledge shape mathematics, think about how mathematics influences personal knowledge. When you learn mathematical knowledge, does it change your perception of the world? On to the next area of knowledge, the natural sciences. The scope and applications of the natural sciences are all about figuring out the laws of the natural world. 
which includes all the physical and living things around us. The natural world is huge, so the natural sciences include a broad range of subjects. Biology, physics, chemistry, zoology, astronomy, geology, and much more. What unites these diverse disciplines? The natural sciences explore how and why natural systems work across multiple levels. Often, this shared knowledge is independent of geographical location and culture. Scientists prioritise making observations about the world and explaining these observations through reason and also imagination. Using these observations and explanations, scientists can make generalised statements about how the world works. This also helps us make predictions about the natural world. These generalised statements can be laws, which tell us about fundamental features of the natural world, or principles, which tell us about how specific phenomena occur. Beyond this, a theory explains and unites many laws in terms of certain underlying principles. Consider Isaac Newton's groundbreaking finding. One day, Newton was hit on the head by an apple which fell from a tree. He came to a crucial observation. Apples fell downwards, but never upwards or sideways. Why was that the case? Eventually, Newton used reason to determine that there was probably a force acting on the apple. Eventually, this led him to discover the law of universal gravitation. You might have noticed that Newton identified a causal relationship. Many scientific laws are causal. They describe how a certain effect can be traced to a fundamental cause. If gravity, a cause, acts on a falling apple, then the apple will fall downwards as a result. The natural sciences can be applied to other areas of knowledge as well. For instance, Psychologists can apply knowledge from the field of genetics to understand human behaviour. You can also consider the relevance of scientific knowledge in another area, history. For example, archaeologists use radiocarbon dating to determine the age of ancient objects, which then supports the production of historical knowledge. What are the key concepts and language of the natural sciences? In other words, how can we describe the rules of the natural world? Since principles, laws and theories need to be generalisable, that is, applicable to a broad range of situations, natural scientists need precise language that clearly and accurately communicates the rules of the natural world. To achieve this, Scientific language tries to avoid any emotion or bias. This is why mathematical language is fundamental in the natural sciences. It deals with precise, measurable quantities. You'll often find scientific laws, like Newton's law of universal gravitation, expressed in mathematical notation. Now, natural scientists use particular methodologies to guide their research and experimentation. The scientific method outlines how natural scientists often go about producing knowledge. First, scientists will make an observation about the world around them, as Newton did with the falling apple. Next, they'll come up with a hypothesis which is a proposed explanation based on the knowledge that is available at the time. Then, they'll test this hypothesis through experimentation, which may involve taking measurements and applying models. The experimental results will ideally prove or disprove the hypothesis, allowing scientists to produce a more generalised statement about the system being studied. To further understand the scientific method, let's delve into the historical development of the natural sciences. The scientific method, as we know it, only emerged during the scientific revolution in 16th and 17th century Europe, 
starting with scientists like Sir Francis Bacon. Over the years, as more and more people embraced the scientific method, people's views of the world changed radically. Especially in the West, many started to value scientific reasoning as a better way of understanding the world than blindly following religious faith. Do you think that faith can ever play a role in the natural sciences? Asking questions like this helps us understand how this area of knowledge links to personal knowledge. Individuals can gain a lot from accessing the shared knowledge that makes up the natural sciences. Scientific knowledge can have a huge impact on how individuals view and think about the world. Thanks to scientific discoveries, we now know that it's actually the Earth that revolves around the sun and that proper hygiene practices prevent the transmission of disease. Similarly, the body of shared knowledge that makes up the natural sciences has benefited enormously from the personal knowledge of scientists throughout history. We can thank Newton for his insights on motion and gravity, Rosalind Franklin contributed to our understanding of DNA, and George Washington Carver developed a method of crop rotation for farmers. These days, individual researchers often collaborate to produce shared knowledge in the natural sciences. Congratulations! We've just covered two areas of knowledge. You're well on your way to understanding TOC basics. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on TOC Basics, check out our next video on Areas of Knowledge, Lesson 2.